Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. Tonight we are imaging the Crescent Nebula. This is a target that frames up really well with my Celestron Edge 8. As you can see, uh, things are going pretty smoothly here. The guiding is going great. I'm very happy with it. And uh, where this target is at, I can actually uh, image it from sun up. I mean, from excuse me, <laughs> from sunset to sun up. So my uh, imaging run uh, of the crescent has finished. I was able to image this for a few days in a row, and I have a total of 77 10-minute subs of HA and 95 10-minute subs of O3. So if my math is correct, it's a little over 28 hours total. And I thought it'd be cool to uh, just blink through all of these really quick so you can see what a single sub of HA looks like. The uh, 294 mono camera that I'm using does produce amp glow, uh, but this calibrates out with no problem. Right, the 03. And so these really bright subs here, that's from clouds. These really dark ones in the middle of the night, that's probably some passing clouds. Also at the beginning, so I started the subs at typically around 10.30 or so, and you can see that that first sub is always a little, a little bright. Now I shot the Crescent last year, uh, but I did that with my ASI 533 and the 70 uh, millimeter refractor. So here's what it looked like last year. And here's what the stacked images of HA and O3 came out to be. Now these shots here, they're not stretched. But uh, I think they came out pretty good. Now, what I did for each one separately is I ran dynamic background on bo uh, twice on each one. You'll see HA is registered. Uh, the reason why this says registered here is that I cropped the O3 first, and then I registered the HA to the O3 film, uh, frame. After DBE, I did denoise. Denoise was simply running through the Easy Processor Suite denoise option. And I left everything pretty much default. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, I dialed back the strength of TGV a little bit. And then after denoise, I ran deconvolution. And so that's what you see here is DBE, denoise, and deconvolution. So the next thing that I did was a linear fit. So for color calibration, you have a couple of options. You can do a photometric uh, color calibration, or you can do a traditional uh, where you do the background neutralization and then you run color calibration. Uh, that's right over here. But another way is to do a linear fit. And so what I did is I used the O3, if I pull it up. Yeah, you can see it's already there. So I used the O3 as the reference and I applied it to the HA. And so that matches the HA signal to the O3 signal. And what that gives us, just use the uh, LRGB combination tool, HA red, O3 green, and O3 blue. And uh, this is what we get. So, I mean, this looks 
great already, and I haven't even done anything except these uh, pre, uh, pre-stretch pre steps. Uh, had I used the HA as a reference for linear fit and applied it to the O3, uh, the, o th uh, the O3 shell would not have been as strong, but we would have got more HA signal around here. Well, my goal with this image was to really uh, emphasize the O3 shell. I think that's just the coolest feature of this object. So that's what I wanted to focus on. Now the next step would be stretching this and basically what I did is I just went back to the easy processing suites again and I ran a soft stretch. This typically does a pretty good job. It doesn't always do a great job but in this case it worked out pretty well. And so next I ran uh, Starnet to uh, remove the stars. And of course it gener generated the mask, so here are my stars on the left, and here's the starless image. And so once I get to this stage, I like to do what I call season to taste. And so it's a lot of work with curves, uh, and I use a lot of range masks, and uh, sometimes I use a color mask, um, and I think I did use a color mask near the end uh, a cyan color mask just to help uh, increase the uh, saturation on that O3 shell uh, without affecting anything else. And then of course these stars need some work too because you can see there's a the the O3 color is very strong on these stars. So here's the next version of the starless actually version 3. I save multiple copies as I go. Uh, and so I think this is where I ended up for the most part before adding the stars back together. And I have to say, although I'm a fan, or I should say I prefer the stars uh, in the completed images, the, uh, the starless images do give you a chance to see some of the structure that's obscured by all the stars. In this particular image I had a lot of stars in it. And of course I do some work on the stars as well. So you can see that I got rid of most of that green if we compare it. It's it's tricky to not let the blues overpower it when you subtract the green from the star mass. So you have to be careful with that and you know you get some of the reddish orange stars in there. I mean the, I think the only way to do better than this is to actually shoot RGB stars and I was tempted to I'll be honest uh, but um, you know, usually I get these uh, imaging runs in between windows of opportunity and, and now we've got uh, we've got a bright moon out and uh, you might be able to hear on the recording there's a storm going on at the moment so not doing any shooting right now all right so let's take a look at the finished product there we go. So overall I'm quite happy with the way this one uh, came out. Uh, the stars look pretty good to me and the O3 shell looks fantastic. Um, you know I got to a point where I just kept tinkering with the image with curves and uh, you know near the end of your processing sometimes you start to do more harm than good. And uh, Part of the skill is to know when to, when to call it quits. So at least for now, I'm calling this one finish. So I'd love to hear what you guys think, how this one turned out. Any suggestions, I'm certainly open to that. Um, please subscribe if you like this. And um, clear skies.